And we can now move on to questions to the Minister of the Environment. And I call Mr. Cattle Boylan. Mr. Boylan. Chest ever hand, let a hold. Question number one, please. Ensuring that all me members of the new Shadow Councils are trained to deliver both existing and, importantly, new responsibilities is critical to the success of the Local Government Reform Programme. I have put in place a range of capacity building measures and granted generous funding at both the local and regional level to enable councillors and indeed council officers and other staff to embrace and meet the complex and demanding challenges of reform. Cap capacity building and training for councillors is a priority and over the last year my department has been working closely with key stakeholders representing the interests of councillors such as the local government training group, the National Association of Councillors and the Northern Ireland Local Government Association to help identify need and draw up practical delivery programmes. One of the organisations we have tasked to deliver some of this training, the Local Government Training Group, has presented my department with a comprehensive capacity delivery plan with the first strands of training and induction to begin as soon as possible following the recent elections. This will include training in the new code of conduct for councillors. Future plans to be delivered via the training group include training in corporate responsibilities and governance, equality, finance and audit accountability, decision making and council representation. This training will be rolled out comprehensively during the shadow period with a flexible and modular approach deemed to fit with the many demands councillors are likely to face. With planning responsibilities moving to councils, DOE Planning has developed a comprehensive training programme which it will be delivering on a sub-regional basis from September onwards. Capacity building and training will be undertaken through role play scenarios as well as formal training sessions and will make use of the experience of colleagues across the water and down south to make the training as realistic as possible. Food, full details of the training programme will issue to councils shortly. Mr. Boylan for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and could I thank the Minister for his answer. But, but in light of the capacity building assistance, will the Minister consider extending the time frames for assistance from his department in the light of the may need it? Because given the fact that we've only got 10 months in terms of the planning training, will he, will he extend them time frames if need be? Gormil Margaret. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I thank the, the member for the supplementary question. The, the, the new councils kick in really on the 1st of April next year. I certainly don't intend the training to stop there. It will be continuous professional development, if you like, and members must be supported throughout the council term as they come to terms with their new responsibilities and, as I suppose, areas where training might be needed are identified. Call Mr Michael Copeland. Thank you very much. Um, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers thus far. Uh, the Minister may be aware or could suspect I've spent some time recently in the close company of a recently elected councillor and of fundamental interest to her is how she is going to equip herself by training for the role that she is going to undertake. Could I ask you, Minister, to detail how the £3 million secured from the Executive will be spent to ensure that um, new councillors are provided with adequate training to allow them to make the right decisions and in the right time frame? I thank uh, the member for the question. As well as an allocation of over £500,000 to the local government training group to deliver regionally based uh, capacity building programmes, new councils have an allocation of £100,000 each or £200,000 in the case of Belfast. That's for the current financial year, but they can use that to develop additional programmes and activities for both councillors and staff relevant to each local area. What's relevant for one area might not be so re relevant for the other. I'm uh, fully satisfied that this funding will be sufficient, that it will be targeted in the right areas and that its use will be open and transparent. My officials have put in place an accountability mechanism to ensure that any capacity building proposals my department is asked to support will require prior approval. To date, however, requests for funding from councils for local capacity building has been relatively poor. 
and officials are now working with the new councils to help them prepare plans that will hopefully allow them to access the funding and identify what it should be used for. Well, Mr. Ian McCray. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, obviously, uh, no one doubts the importance of um, the training needs of, of many of the new super councillors, as they're being referred to in some quarters. Um, but can the minister detail if the training is compulsory, or certain aspects of training um, that may be compulsory, um, what would happen in the case of a councillor who, no matter how much flexibility is in the system, they don't actually get trained? What will happen in that case, and you know, what limitations will there be on that individual council or councillors? I thank the member for that question, and I think he makes a very valid point there. I think it's important to realise that this training isn't or shouldn't be seen as a burden on elected representatives. It's there to assist elected representatives and ultimately, hopefully, protect elected representatives. So it's vitally important that we ensure people don't fall through the net or people don't, in some cases, try to dodge through the net. But all councillors in both existing and new councils will be strongly encouraged to attend training associated with the new mandatory code of conduct. Councillors who sit on the planning committee particularly will need to be fully aware of the planning process and ethical obligations relating to that role. Call Mr. question two, please. PPS 21 is the main planning policy in relation to development in the countryside. In drafting PPS 21, officials sought to ensure that its policies provided sufficient opportunities for all sections of the rural community, not just those from a farming background. Therefore, whilst PPS 21 does not include a policy specifically for non-farming rural dwellers, almost all of its provisions provide opportunities for them. Policies open to non-farm rural dwellers include the conversion and reuse of non-residential buildings as dwellings, replacement dwellings, new dwellings within an existing cluster or ribbon of buildings, social and affordable housing schemes, development within designated dispersed rural communities, and a dwelling to meet compelling personal or domestic circumstances. Furthermore, any farm dwelling approved under policy CTY10 may be occupied by non-farmers and may be sold off without restriction. I believe that, taken together, these policy provisions already provide very significant opportunities for people from a non-farming background to continue to live in the countryside. The issue of non-farming rural dwellers was also addressed through my predecessor's review on the operation of PPS 21. As part of his review, he met with former members of the Independent Working Group on Non-Farming Rural Dwellers. This group was originally established by Minister Wilson to explore options for non-farming rural dwellers as part of the draft PPS 21. The previous members reiterated their advice that planning policy should not create a special category for the non-farming rural dweller, and the planning decisions for single houses should not be determined on the basis of kinship, connection or occupation. The Minister's review concluded that PPS 21 was operating effectively and that the need for a fundamental review did not arise at that time. Whilst I endorse these conclusions, I nevertheless undertook to examine the issues afresh as part of the consultation on the draft single strategic planning policy statement to ensure that the SPPS will adequately meet the needs of current and future generations of farming and non-farming rural dwellers alike. Mr. Austin, for supplement. Alaska and Korea is going to waste an IRA soaked in agrish, and, and the Minister will recognise, of course, that uh, a majority of people living in the country that are from non-farming uh, are non-farming dwellers. And uh, that, this addition has not been addressed, and given the fact that, that uh, powers are now uh, transferring to local government, that there will be barriers uh, put in the place of non-farming uh, rural dwellers. Um, I wonder what, uh, um, how he is going to address those issues and those concerns. I uh, thank the, the, the member for his supplementary question. Yes, uh, the issues around non-farming and indeed on occasion farming rural dwellers and their applications for houses are often complex and complicated. Many members in this House will have been in with me with constituents on particularly complex cases. I became always 
on such occasions to be as flexible as possible. This was the subject of a debate in the Assembly tabled by the, the member's own party uh, six or seven weeks ago. And during that debate, I, I gave assurances that I would use the SPPS as I suppose, an opportunity to look at PPS 21, what improvements might be made, what assurances could be given to the very constituents to which the member refers. Call Mr. Sammy Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the countryside has already been raped by extensive industrial type wind energy projects. Will the minister assure us that he will not relax PPS 21 further to allow um, the, the, the kind of open door policy which is being suggested by Sinn Féin and which will lead to even further destruction of the countryside? I thank uh, the member for his question, although I'm not, I might not necessarily agree with the first part of it. Uh, the member again makes a, a valid point. During that debate, I think it was Mr Agnew uh, produced figures around the number of approvals that had been granted to dwellings, and, and, or was yourself, was it, uh, to dwellings in the countryside over the past number of years. And they do indeed indicate that PPS 21 is quite relaxed. It's certainly relaxed in comparison to its predecessor, PPS 14. What we do need to do is just get the balance right, the balance between the needs of those uh, living in the countryside and those who want to live in the countryside and the need to sustain our countryside. Call Mr Roy Beggs. I was interested in the previous question. Uh, I understand that it was PPS 18 that perhaps has more uh, direction to where wind farms are located in the countryside. Uh, does the Minister find it strange that such a question comes from someone who actually developed that policy and has pre as, as, as the, the Minister who followed him actually implemented it? I thank the member for that question. I thank him very much <laughs> <laughs> I, actually for it. Uh, nothing shocks me. No questions from, uh, <laughs> from Mr Wilson. Uh, but PPS 18, quite rightly, as, as the member identifies, deals with re renewable energy. Of the 700 responses to the consultation on the draft SPPS, I fully expect PPS 18 to be among the policies most mentioned, one of the more thumbed sections of the single strategic planning policy statement. Now, while the Minister may have welcomed the last question, the Deputy Speaker does not, and in future supplementary questions will be brief and relate to the question. I call Mr Peter Weir. Uh, question three, can't be briefer than that. <laughs> As regards amenity, statutory responsibility for improving the quality of local beaches lies with beach operators, who for the most part are the relevant local authorities in which the beach is located. My department also plays its part. I personally chair the Good Beach Summit, which brings together beach operators and other organisations with an interest in healthy beaches, both from an amenity and water quality perspective. This group is currently implementing an action plan covering the areas of water quality, beach cleanliness, facilities management and signage, public information and supporting the coastal economy. My department also published the Northern Ireland Marine Litter Strategy in July last year and is currently coordinating its implementation. This strategy responds to the problem of litter on our coastline and makes provision for concerted action against those who continue to drop litter through education, awareness raising and volunteering programmes, along with promoting a strong system of enforcement. The Department is also working with Northern Ireland Water to improve sewerage infrastructure across the whole of the Northern Ireland coastline. An estimated £12 million has been allocated for the period 2013 to 2015 to address bathing water areas with infrastructure upgrades planned for Benone, Ballycastle, Ballygolly, Mill Isle, Newcastle and Bangor. In fact, 2013 was the best year ever for bathing water quality in Northern Ireland. All beaches passed the mandatory standard. What's more, 20 of the 23 beaches had water quality classified as excellent. 
call Mr Weir for supplementary. Thank the Minister for his answer, and I think we'd all welcome the improvements that have happened in terms of beach quality. Can I ask the Minister, through the beach summits or any other mechanism, whether there are specific targets being developed uh, that, in terms of beach quality that the Department is then aiming to reach? I uh, thank the member for his supplementary question. Uh, I think it's important that we do set targets, but realistic targets and nothing too aspirational. And to that effect, we have. I don't have the detail of those targets, but I'll certainly get it to the, the, the member. The issue of, of beach quality and beach cleanliness is one that very much came to the fore last summer with a report uh, by Tidy NI on the extent of littering on our beaches. So keeping them clean is something that I take extremely uh, seriously, not just in terms of the environmental damage that litter on our beaches does, but also in terms of the damage it does to our image and uh, the detriment it might have to attracting tourists. Yeah. Well, Mr. Pat Ramsey. <clears throat> Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Following on from the main question in terms of the quality of beaches, could I ask the Minister in terms of the, the quality of access as well, in terms of uh, for disabled people, for example, could the Minister lean to the House any assessment or what steps could be taken to ensure that we have effective and good access for disabled people onto the beaches? I thank uh, the member for his question. The issue of accessibility to our beaches is something that I personally have raised with my departmental officials since taking office, and it's something that is being worked on. We do have a, a couple of beaches, I'm not going to name and shame, that remain inaccessible, and that's something that we really need to address so that everyone can enjoy our beautiful beaches. Well, Mr Oliver, Mike Muller. Oh, uh, in your report, Minister, you do talk about the environmental side of things on your beaches, uh, etc., and the quality of bathing water. In the uh, Keep Northern Ireland Beautiful report, which was done in conjunction with the Tourist Board, there's two beaches glaringly admitted. And when I inquired about them, I've been told the report and the inspection of those beaches haven't been done, and that's the beaches of Cushion Dunn and Cushion Dahl. And secondly, Minister, Waterfoot Beach has one of the few sand dune, uh, uh, scheme, uh, sand dune beaches, and it's not, even, uh, it's not even in your departments for conservation, for money to be spent on those dunes. And I think that's a, a, a disgrace out there. Or, for, order, for please. This is a very Could long question. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And thank the member for his speech. Sorry, question. <laughs> uh, I also thank the member for actually bringing this to my attention. It's not something I, I was aware of, and I shall have inspections carried out on those beaches as a matter of urgency. The issue around the, the dunes is something I shall also make inquiries with my officials about. Well, Mr. William Humphreys. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question number four. My department has engaged and held discussions with the Driving Instructors National Association Council, DINAC, throughout the policy development in relation to the proposed changes to driver licensing and the associated graduated driver licensing GDL scheme. DINAC was established in 2008 as an umbrella organisation bringing together representatives from all of the approved driving instructor associations and acting as a central point of contact for communication with my department. A full public consultation was carried out on the proposals over the period March to, to July 2011. During this time, in May 2011, a departmental official attended a DINAC meeting and provided a detailed presentation of the GDL proposals, and in November 2011, my predecessor met with representatives of DINAC to discuss the consultation. In May 2012, Minister Atwood published his views on the way forward for learner and restricted drivers, which included a proposal for a graduated driver licensing scheme. Minister Atwood attended a further DINAC meeting on the 25th of September 2012 to discuss GDL. In addition to this, the GDL proposals were discussed at several of the Road Safety Forum meetings, which I chair on a quarterly basis and on which DINAC is represented. The Road Traffic Amendment Bill has just completed the second stage of the legislative process, and I look forward to continuing to engage with DINAC, whom I recognise as a key stakeholder over the coming months. 
Mr. Humphrey for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for his answer. Minister, learners are not necessarily all young people. Many more mature members of the community learn to drive, and many uh, young people get a license for identity reasons. Can I ask you, will this new legislation not force all uh, learners to wait here for a year? Will it not discriminate and adversely affect, for example, disabled members of our society, pregnant women, job seekers, and people from a low income background? I uh, thank the, the, the member for his question and indeed recognise his concerns. They are concerns that were aired during the debate on the second stage of this bill by members from across the, the, the political parties. There will be and are already exemptions and exceptions to the one year mandatory learning period. As we now go to committee stage with the, this bill, they will be open to further interrogation. And I think it's vitally important that people can learn to drive if needs must. I know there will be ex exemptions for people maybe with caring responsibilities and also take on board the, the members' concerns about those with disability. Mr. Patsy McLoone. Uh, last year on colleagues, we have slashed out as an an regular Kimshia Kanisha. Thanks very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his, his wide ranging um, response up until now. Uh, will the Minister accept that aside from DINAC, which of course is, is a, an extremely responsible and indeed useful organisation with which to consult, will the Minister accept the need to consult with also youth organisations and also particularly uh, rural based organisations such as farming organisations for whom driving and the capacity to drive is just more than a social event. It can be part of an integral part of the local rural economy. Order, please. This is another very long question. I uh, thank the, the, the member for his question. I think it is vitally important that we consult with as many people as possible, as many stakeholders as possible, and I remain determined to do so over the coming weeks and months. I will uh, be engaged in further consultation, as I am sure the, the committee will be under the chairmanship of uh, Ms Lowe. So I look forward to that. The member mentions the farming community and, uh, and rural dwellers. Again, they are on my list as those who need consulted with. He also spoke about youth organisations, but as Mr Humphreys had, had pointed out, it is not just younger people who will be learning to drive. However, some of the elements proposed in the scheme are specific to young people, so I think it is very important that we do engage with them and, and ensure that they know that this is not about singling them out for harsh treatment. This is about protecting them and maybe even saving their lives. Mr Danny Kennan. Thank you very much, um, Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for his answers so far, but will he accept that driving instructors and drivers, particularly those, as we have already heard, in the rural areas, will have different opinions and different needs depending on how much public transport is available. I thank the, the member for that supplementary question. I am aware that different people in different areas will have different needs. I am aware of many differences of opinion out there already on the bill, even at this early stage, and quite a few of them have come from driving instructors as well. I intend to listen to all the, these points of view and ensure that the bill that we end up with is one that, that strikes the right balance between improving and increasing road safety and uh, affording people the liberty and, and, and freedom of movement that they require. Call Mr Chris Hazard. I am aware of the ongoing review of the MLA Code by the Committee on Standards and Privileges and of the Committee's recent consultation on the Code. I have asked officials to liaise with the Committee staff and to prepare a report for my consideration on the outcome of that review. I will consider whether a revised Code of Conduct for Councillors should be drafted for 2015 when the new councils take on their full role and responsibilities and taking account of any changes made to the MLA code. Any lessons learned during the shadow period and the Environment Committee's consideration of the guidance on planning matters to be issued in support of the Councillor's Code. 
Any revised code will, of course, be laid in draft in the Assembly to give members the opportunity to consider and debate it. Mr. Hazard for supplementary. Well, last conclusion, I thank the Minister for his answer thus far. I'd just like the Minister to perhaps uh, outline if he has indeed looked at any other assemblies or parliaments throughout Europe, perhaps more specifically uh, Leicester House, to see if there is a TD code of conduct and if any lessons can be learned for the members here in the Assembly. I thank uh, the, the, the member for his question. Yeah, uh, my, my department has been looking at w what is done elsewhere, what works elsewhere and what might not work so well elsewhere. I think it's important that, again, I, I'll go back to balance, that the code strikes the right balance, that it actually protects councillors uh, as, they, as they carry out their functions. The issue around the MLA code and the need to sort of get more of a synergy with that is one I accept fully. Whenever we debated the, the code last week, it was a point made by Mr Ross, and it's something that I've now instructed my, my officials to make sure and liaise more closely with our standards and privileges. Well, Mr Gregory Campbell. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, the Minister has uh, said that he's going to have a look to see if uh, a new code of conduct will be required for councillors. And, th and that is welcome. Will he take account of the fact that uh, since the election, the new election to the super councils, there's at least one instance, if not more, of an elected councillor being asked about his attitude to a specific act of terrorism in Londonderry and declining to condemn it? Will he make sure that we have a very strict code of conduct and sanctions for those who might try to sign and then usurp it later? I uh, thank the, the member for his question, and I'm aware of the incident to uh, w which he re refers. Indeed, that councillor was in a tiny, tiny minority of the people of my city who came out in complete condemnation of that, of that attack. While I spoke of how the code can protect councillors, it's important <laughs> that it's there to protect the public as well, and people in public office should be fit for that office. They should abide by the Nolan principles and uh, show the leadership that, that is required in such a position of responsibility. And the gentleman to which Mr Campbell refers certainly didn't do that last week. Call Ms Anna Lou. Deputy Speaker, can the Minister give an update on the development of the revised uh, mechanisms for adjudication and appeal uh, in relation to a breach of, of a, the new code of conduct? I thank uh, Ms Lowe for her question. The issue around the appeal on, on the code of conduct, there's still uh, quite a bit of work being done on that. It came about as a result of an amendment to the local government bill here in the Assembly. I'm currently working with the Commissioner on that, and I'm content that in the coming weeks, We'll have more meat on the bones, if you like. Mr. Mervyn's story is not in his place. I move on to Mr. Michael McJimsey. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question number seven. It was clear during the making of the 2014 Local Government Act that opinions are divided on the power to surcharge councillors and council officers deemed responsible for unlawful expenditure. Whether this power should be retained has been a matter for much discussion and debate. In light of this, Section 109 of the 2014 Local Government Act has provided the Department with a power to remove the legislative provisions relating to the power of surcharge. Rather than legislate immediately for the removal of the power to surcharge, I think there is a need to build up a body of evidence over a period of some years while the new ethical standards regime introduced by the Act is in operation to inform any decision on the possible removal of the ability to surcharge. It is only when such evidence has been gathered that I will be in a position to consider the matter fully and make the appropriate decision on whether to retain the power to surcharge. Therefore, councillors and council officers will, for the foreseeable future, continue to be subject to the possibility of being surcharged. We will now move on to topical questions and I call Mrs Pam Cameron. 
Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And can I ask the Minister if he is aware of the company Full Circle Power's ability and willingness to process domestic waste at their Bombardier site in Belfast? I'm sorry, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I missed the first part of that question. Could the member repeat it, please? Uh, Thank you, Minister. Yes, it was to ask if you are aware of the full circle power's ability to, and willingness to process domestic waste um, um, in their Bombardier site in Belfast. Uh, I thank the member for the question, which I heard second time, and I have to also thank her for bringing that to my, my attention. I wasn't aware of that. I will make it my business to become aware of it. The Bombardier plant that was approved some months ago has tremendous capacity. However, it was my understanding, and has been my understanding, that it would be for municipal waste rather than domestic, so that's certainly something to look into. Supplementary. Thank you. And, and given um, this information, Minister, can I ask, um, given that the, the relevant planning permission is in place and the capacity um, to process household and commercial waste, which Art 21 um, are proposing to be incinerated at the highly controversial site in Molusk. Would the Minister agree that the Arc 21 proposal is not just unwelcome, but is actually entirely unnecessary? I thank uh, the, the member for that question. However, I'm not really at liberty to answer it, given that the planning application for the Arc 21 proposed uh, development has been received. It's been classified and will be treated as an Article 31 uh, application. I have had quite a bit of correspondence on it already, and indeed I am meeting elected representatives from different parties, including uh, the member's own colleague, William McRae, MP, within the next two weeks on this very issue. Well, Mr. Sean Rogers for Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Minister, in light of those who tried to discredit the SDLP's uh, role in government, Recently, could you reassure landowners that ASSI designations are not a national park by the back door? As I've uh, thank the member for the question. As I've said before in this chamber, I'm fully aware of national parks and the benefits that they can undoubtedly bring to areas, as they have done in Great Britain and on this island. However, I'm also extremely aware of opposition to national parks here in the north and the concerns of landowners over what designation will mean for them. Given the level of this opposition, I have stated that I do not believe that now is the correct time to proceed with national parks. The Environment Order Northern Ireland 2002, as amended, establishing ASSI designations is totally different from the legislation which would be required to establish a national park and there is no link between these separate pieces of legislation. To date, 375 ASSIs have been designated since 1995, and we have no national parks. Well, Mr. Rogers, for supplement. Thank you, Minister, for that. And as a landowner, if you have land along the, the river in a designated area, the situation is if a tree uh, or other bit of debris blocks, blocks the river, you have to ask NIEA's permission, a ridiculous situation, to remove it. Could I ask for further reassurance from the ministers that the concerns of farmers and landowners within ASSI designations would be adequately addressed? I thank the member for that question. I thought it was going to be, a, if a tree falls <laughs> in a forest and there is no one here, does anyone hear it? Uh, <laughs> The, the, the example that he used there of, of a tree falling in a, a river, well, rivers agency are responsible for the maintenance and flow within rivers, and if rivers agency are undertaking work to remove blockages, the landowner won't be required to apply for permissions. Emergency works can also be undertaken without the prior permission of the department. However, landowners are required to inform the department of the works as soon as possible after their commencement. Other works that are being undertaken by a landowner, such preemptive works, may require the consent of the department. But since 2005, the department have consented over 90% of applications received. Well, Mr. Cahill Boylan for topical question. I'll get the uh, last chance, Cornelia. The minister is well aware of the attacks on ethnic minor minorities over the last uh, number of weeks. Would the minister see this as an opportunity through? 
the community plan element of the local government bill to try and encourage those people to become involved in the community plan element and maybe help progress some of these issues. I thank the member for that question. Indeed, I see community planning as a real opportunity for the whole community to become involved, and I'm determined that the whole community does become involved, including those from uh, ethnic minorities, if not especially those from ethnic minorities. The place that we are living in has become much more diverse and I believe has become much the better for it. I think it's important that we take on board the views of all our citizens whenever we're shaping our future. Mr. Boylan, for supplementary. Mr. Margaret, I last time called you, August Gone Breakish, Les Nair, as Dr. Ragra. I thank you and thank the Minister for the answer. Could the Minister then give us a timeline as to when he will introduce measures like the issue of good relations and maybe equality structures within local government? I thank the member for that supplementary question. Well, I think it's important that we do so as soon as possible. The councils don't assume this new power until the 1st of April, but a key part of their training and capacity building will be around issues such as community relations and such as equality. That's something I know that's very dear to the, the member's heart and something he has raised with me on a number of occasions. I expect to be up and running by September. Well, Mr. Michael, we jump see for a topical question. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister that in the, in, uh, the case of successful planning applications and granting approval in uh, major or contentious uh, uh, applications, that conditioning is a key part of the approval and that the Minister will look hard at a consistent regime to ensure that planning authorities properly condition uh, uh, approvals in cases where there is a, a question of the applicant uh, not meeting their proper obligations. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I thank Mr Majimsi for that question. I think consistency is the key to success in planning, be it the department in charge of that or councils, as they soon will be. However, the major applications to which the member refers will re remain to be dealt with centrally. And as I said, consistency is the key. Conditions have a, do play and they do have a vital role in approving applications, and I believe they should be very enforceable. And if someone does not fulfil their obligations, that they are not let off the hook. Call Mr. Majimsi for supplementary. Uh, can I thank uh, Mr. Deputy? Thank the Minister for that answer. Uh, uh, but could I also point out to him, as he is aware, that there are cases where approvals go through where the, uh, the, the, the conditions are either absent or poorly defined, and particularly in things around uh, pollution, noise pollution, uh, around hours of operations, and so on. And does the Minister agree with me that to get that consistency, he needs to clearly define for the planning, the benefit of the planning officers in those uh, particular cases uh, that we get exactly the outcome that we want? I concur entirely with the member. These conditions would go some way to actually provide uncertainty for the applicant, they would provide comfort for objectors, and they would provide assistance to planning officials and council officials in terms of environmental health. So, I, uh, again, as planning transfers to the councils, this is something that they will be looking closely at in terms of the smaller applications, and with the large-scale applications, it's something that I will be pushing on, because a few cases have come to my attention in the not-so-distant past where conditions have been ignored or conditions might have been, I think, poorly written, as the member put it, and that's something that causes me frustration and something that causes planning officials frustration as well when it comes back across their desk. Mr. Adrian McQuillan for a topical question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister how many times have he overruled his planning service? I thank uh, the, the, the member for his question. I am not that sure how many, <laughs> how many there have. There have been a, there've been a few uh, in cases where I fully appreciate and respect the guidance 
that I am given by my highly qualified and competent staff. However, sometimes I think they don't take all issues into consideration, particularly around, I suppose, public feeling and, and political opposition maybe to applications where those on the ground, locally elected councillors and MLAs, community representatives, they generally know what's best for their area, what will work and what won't. That's one of the huge advantages I see in planning transferring to local councils. Calling for supplementary. Thank you. Can I thank the Minister for his answer? Could the Minister explain to the House and the Objectors and why you overturned the plan on application C 2013-0078 on Needenban Road, Caray, for a hairdressing salon when the planning service had recommended a refusal? I, I, I thank the, the member for his question. I didn't think he would have much of an interest in hairdressers. <laughs> Uh, I, I had received representation fr from the, the, the member and from uh, objectors and indeed the applicant themselves r regarding that application. I, I believe that the service provided by that salon, along with strict conditions, can be sustainable and is sustainable. Mr. Clark is not in his place to call Mr. Patsy McGloan. Uh, thanks very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and, and thank the Minister for his, his answers up until now. Um, could I ask just the Minister what evaluation has been done at his department of the efficiency of NIEA consultations, particularly in relation to planning applications? I thank Mr. McGlone for, for his question. I I am on record again in this Assembly stating that I am conducting and carrying out a root and branch review of NIEA and how it works or how often it does not. Uh, I have also outlined some of my ideas for improving planning. They will include and focus largely on NIEA in terms of consultation responses. I will be setting timelines and time scales for consultation responses. And, uh, NIEA will be top of my list. Call Mr. Bagone uh, for supplement. Thanks very much to the Minister for that answer. Can the Minister give any indication at this point in time when those uh, time frames and deadlines will be applicable for NIEA? I thank the, the member for his question. I fully expect and intend for uh, these new timelines to be fully operational by the time planning transfers to local government to make it easier for them. And I don't want to be here as if I'm just slating NIEA, that's, that's your job. But often applications aren't, aren't done that well either. Good applications will get processed quickly. Applications with information missing or incomplete won't. So it's why Again, going back to my planning improvements or proposed planning improvements, I want to put more emphasis on the likes of pre-application discussions, so any potential problems with NIEA or any other statutory consultees can be flagged up early. Call Mr. Oliver McMullen. Can I ask the Minister, um, it was alluded to earlier on by the member, um, the question of national parks, you, you, you have um, temporary shelter. Can I get an assurance that that temporary will never come out of the box again and the question of National Park is gone because the majority of the people don't want it? Well, I have parked the National Parks uh, project for, for now, certainly, in the light of the huge opposition to it here in the north. I can't I suppose give any assurances as to what future ministers for the environment might do. However, it is my opinion, while recognising the benefits that some other areas have seen through national parks, that the damage done to the national park brand here in Northern Ireland over the past year or so would make it extremely difficult to introduce. I believe there is work to be done with those who have been vociferous in opposition. They maybe see them show them that there, there could be
benefits to it, but I don't think it should be imposed on people against their will, and I certainly wouldn't be doing so. Order time is up. That concludes question time. I invite members.